A few months ago, I was asked to deliver a presentation on oscilloscope best practices to help engineers get the most out of their scope. That included uh, some tips and tricks that were very common and some that maybe weren't so common. So I thought that would make a really good video. So finally, I'm getting around to it. So let's get started. Nearly all of the tips and tricks I'm going to talk about, I've done individual videos on, and I will uh, link those in the video description down below. So in this video, we're just going to hit the highlights of each of those, and for further study, be sure to follow those additional links. The first set of tips has to do with some of the best practices with regard to probing your signals. Now, the vast majority of time, we're using passive 10x probes to get signals into our scope. I've got a video linked down below that talks about the basics of 10x probes and why that's the case. Now one of the most important aspects of using a 10x probe is to ensure it's properly compensated for the scope you're using it on. Because if you don't, you can have some pretty significant errors in amplitude of signals above 10 to 20 kilohertz. So properly compensating your probe is important to get a good flat frequency response. I have another video linked down below that really illustrates the importance of proper compensation of your 10x probes. Now while we're using 10x probes most of the time, sometimes that's not the most appropriate choice. There are probes that are switchable, like this one here, between 1x and 10x mode. Now the 1x mode might be important if you're looking at very low level signals, but it also means that those signals are going to have to be generally lower in frequency because that 1x probe is going to have a lot more capacitive loading and uh, therefore is going to drive the bandwidth that uh, you can measure with that probe down. Most 1x probes are in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 megahertz bandwidth max. But the advantage is, is that they will not reduce the amplitude of your signal by a factor of 10 and you can get effectively nearly a 10 to, 10 to 1 improvement in signal to noise ratio for low level signals. So it's really important to choose, you know, whether a 10x probe or a 1x probe or maybe something like a 2x probe or a 100x probe is appropriate, depending on the voltage level and frequency range of the signals you're looking at. Another important consideration when using 10x probes is, or any of the probes really, is the ground lead length. The longer that ground lead, the longer, the more inductance you're going to put into your measurement path, inducing ringing and things like that. The, the inductance is proportional to this loop area. So sometimes taking that long ground lead and twisting it around your probe to minimize loop area can actually help a little bit. But the best practice when you can get away with it is to not use these longer ground leads, particularly when measuring higher frequency signals. Now different manufacturers and different probe types will have different adapters to allow you to use shorter ground leads. This older style probe actually has got a coaxial ground ring here and one of the available accessories was this little tip here that slipped on top of the probe tip here and has a kind of a spring-loaded ground tip here so I've got a nice short uh, ground loop area uh, here dramatically reducing that inductance. Another example is this sub-miniature type probe here which is a much smaller diameter uh, this one in order to convert from say a longer ground lead like this to a shorter ground lead you would typically remove this little shell, slide the ground ring adapter off, and then there is this uh, other adapter that would slip over the top, and we replace the shroud. And then this kind of semi-rigid ground lead would slip in there and give it me a, a means of getting a nice short, again, low loop area ground connection between this probe and our circuit. Another variation is this particular probe here, where you simply unsnap the witch's hat, and then one of the included accessories is this little ground spring that would slip right over the probe tip and give you a nice spring-loaded uh, ground pin that can connect up to the ground of your circuit and give you some flexibility in moving around the probe tip to a particular area. Now, in the absence of having any of those special adapters, you can even make your own. Uh, I did another video a while back that showed making a custom uh, low inductance, high performance ground socket using nothing more than some stiff wire uh, where you can literally pro plug this probe right in and make a connection to the circuit you're testing and getting ground in a very low inductance way. Again, the link to this video will be down below. These next set of tips have to do with optimizing the vertical aspects of the scope. Uh, first and foremost, 
especially for digital scopes, really want your signal to occupy as much of the full-scale graticle as possible. Because whether it's an 8-bit scope like this, or a 12-bit scope, or whatever, that EDC is optimized to capture you know, full-range signals. If you adjust your vertical scale so the signal is only occupying a division or two, you're not taking best advantage of the full resolution of the DAC. So you really want to adjust that as, as best as full scale as possible. If uh, your signal starts going above screen, try moving your position down to kind of get things properly centered on the display. Now for some signals that might not be possible. Let's go over and probe this signal over here. Let's speed up the scope here a little bit. And we can see this particular signal if I want to optimize the vertical scale of this, I can see I'm only occup occupying about half of the screen. So I can adjust my vertical scale, but you'll notice that I can't bring my position down enough to bring the waveform all the way down. This is where you want to take advantage of a feature called Offset. So on this particular scope, under the More menu, we can go to Offset, and I could dial in an Offset value. And what that does is it repositions where my reference point is. So instead of re the reference point being at ground, the reference point is now going to be at whatever that vertical offset value is. So for example, if I put that near the center of the screen and adjust my offset value down, uh, I can get that, that signal to essentially now occupy full scale on the screen, Okay, in this case 200 millivolts of division, by having an offset value of about 1.6 volts. So the offset value allows you to now shift the vertical expansion point of your vertical scaling to help you position your waveform within you know essentially the full scale range of the ADC. So don't forget about um, the offset as opposed to position. And again I've got a video on this that I'll link down below. Another vertical setting to think about uh, certainly is uh, your input coupling. Okay so uh, you know AC coupling will essentially allow you to get rid of any DC offset on a signal and then adjust just around the DC, you know, the, the average of the signal up or down. So uh, it's kind of like an automatic offset control if the signal is well balanced around uh, some midpoint. But uh, sometimes you don't want to AC couple because you might want to see, you know, some DC drift in the signal. AC coupling would get rid of that. So DC coupling and offset control can sometimes be as effective as just using AC coupling. Another consideration is to consider what you need for vertical bandwidth. Uh, this is a 1 gigahertz scope and I can see I've got some noise on the signal here. It might make it hard to kind of measure what those levels are. So I, if I go down my bandwidth control I can choose say 250 megahertz or even 20 megahertz of bandwidth and greatly clean up the signal by getting rid of some of that wideband noise. Of course, you've got to apply this judiciously to be sure you're not going to roll off an important aspect of your signal. Now let's take a look at some of the horizontal controls. Now the screen will generally tell you a little bit what's going on. So in this case, I've got two microseconds of division, I'm sampling at 500 megasample per second using 10,000 points for record length. Now you'll note that the scope is a five gigasample per second scope. So what's happening here is this, you've, you've essentially told the scope, I'm going to use 10,000 points. So when I go to faster speeds, okay, now I'm running in that full five gig, you know, five giga sample per second, but I'm at 20 nanoseconds of division. That's how I'm getting my 10,000 points. As I work my way down, you can see that now as I get slower at 400 nanoseconds of division, I've cut the sample rate to two and a half to fill up those 10,000 points. As I keep going down, you can see that now at this two microseconds of division, my sample rate has dropped. So I'm essentially throwing away you know, nine points for every you know, ten that I capture in order to build this waveform. Now of course you might not want to do that. You might have some very fast edges here so you want the sample rate to be higher. So you generally have control over that. If I went into the acquire menu here and went to use a longer record length instead of 10,000 points, if I go down to say a million points, now I'm at back up to five giga sample per second again. So again, take note of the sample rate and what you need in terms of sample density to accurately represent the fast transitions and fast edges that you've got on your particular waveforms. But you do generally have control over that. The scope will generally default to some value 
and that may or may not be appropriate depending on your signal. So take a note of what the scope is actually giving you in terms of the actual captured waveform sample rate and then maybe make adjustments to your record length as necessary. The other thing to think, keep in mind when it comes to, especially when the sample rate is getting reduced, is to consider what the sample mode is. So most will default to what's called the sample mode, which as I've described, is you know sampling at the full 5 giga sample per second, but essentially throwing away samples in order to you know fill the record length that you asked for for the record duration you asked for. That's what sample mode does. There's also a peak detect mode, which will look through all those points that are going to be decimated and plot the highest and lowest values of them. There's a high-res mode that does an in-situ averaging of those points to give you one point for all, for all the points that would contribute to a particular waveform point. So you can see that actually has a, an effect of low-pass filtering the waveform and giving me some cleaner data. The envelope mode is kind of like a peak detect with a hold. And then, of course, there's the average mode, which does averaging over multiple acquisitions, as opposed to high res, which is an in situ average on each acquisition. Again, I've got a video down below that uh, goes into these sample modes in more depth. Now, of course, this is just a quick overview of some of the most common uh, settings and changes and optimizations you can make when using your scope to get the most out of it. Proper probing practices, good control over your ground lead lengths, Make sure the probes are compensated. Uh, make sure that your, heart, your vertical scale and possibly using vertical offset are set properly to optimize the signal amplitude. Use the bandwidth that's appropriate for the signals that you want to measure. Maybe this, use the sampling mode that is most appropriate that's going to give you the cleanest possible signal. And also optimize what you're doing in terms of sample capture in terms of by adjusting record length and the associated sample rate uh, with that. There's lots of other aspects, of course, to using a scope. These are some of the most common things that I see people not doing appropriately that they can do to improve their setups. If you have more, please uh, give me a comment. List down below some other uh, tips and tricks that you've learned with your particular scope. And thanks again, as always, for watching.